uh, not, not super alert in your mind, why don't you all get up, let's all get up and high five the person right next to you or to your side, maybe get one or two. And remember, this is what grace is, getting a high five from the Lord, even though you know yourself to be a sinner. All right. Are we grateful and glad for God's grace? You may sit down. <clears throat> I'm glad to see you're smiling. Are you grateful for God's grace? Amen. 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 So, uh, as the song, beautiful song that uh, songs that, that Anne sang, let's spend some moments in rest in God's word and at His feet, learning from His words. Amen. Um, why don't you bow with your heads with me as we pray? Father in heaven, <coughs> Lord, we are once again at your feet, wanting to learn, to take rest, to have a rest, to, as you made that so clear to your friends in Bethany, one thing is needed. God, protect us, protect our hearts so that it may not be taken away from us, just like you did with Mary. Have mercy on us because we are sinners. Give us understanding, give us a focused mind and hearts, and may we worship you now through the Word of God. In, his, in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. How many of you here are in school? Still, you're taking, you're in school. All right, good, good. How many of you have been to school? I think most of us here in the West, uh, here in the United States and America, most of us have been to school. What are, what are some things that, there's something in school that some, tends to be very, um, it's tough sometimes, and it brings us a lot of stress. Tests. tests. Somebody said math. <laughs> yeah, but it's not math necessarily. It's math tests more than anything, right? And it makes us worry and anxious, and we're like, oh, no. The test, the exam is coming, and I'm not sure if I know the material. This is going to be a, a difficult class, and the midterm is coming, and the quiz tomorrow. And, and it's not a... <clears throat> Tests are not easy. They're not fun. And uh, I, I remember having a, a uh, um, no, I had a teacher, okay? This teacher, uh, his nickname when I was in high school, my senior year in high school, his nickname was Taka Taka, okay? And uh, his, his, he, he, he was one of those professors, one of those teachers that thinks that you should be as smart and educated as he was. And this teacher was, fit, it was a physics teacher. So when he was uh, teaching, you know, he would go and say, well, you know, he had this big uh, blackboard, you know, and so, you know, here goes, this is a physics teacher, right? Here goes this object flying at so many meters per second, and this, this, at what time, if some of them, like, what's the answer, you know, solve for X or whatever, and you know, like, uh, you know, and you know the rest, you know, and the, the rest, you, you know, it just goes, taka, 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 and at the end of every time, every lesson he would give, every day, he would go at the end, taka, 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 you know, and he would go with, uh, with chalk really hard, and we were like, oh, my God. Taka taka. We have class with taka taka. And so this, this guy had a thing that he would, when we were tested, when we had an exam with him, uh, he would not bring anything written for us, anything prepared. He would just uh, copy one problem on the, on the, on the board and say, Ta one, two, solve. You know, oh my goodness, or sometimes it was usually, or sometimes it was a concept, you know, uh, what's, what, what, how, how do you know that this is true or this true or false or whatever. So he would dictate this, this, this one question, the first one question. It was just usually a short answer that he, we needed to write down. The rest was a problem. And so through the hallways, right before class, he would come shouting through the hallways, the first question, <laughs> and he would shout, Primero! And, and it meant first question, right? And we were like, oh, Taka Taka's voice was scary and frightening. And so it was, it was just not cool. And, 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 and uh, you know, this teacher, 
uh, it was a very good professor nonetheless, and, and, and many of my classmates did very well. Uh, I became a pastor, had nothing to do with physics. Um, others, and in, in fact, one of my classmates became a, a, um, a recently, uh, we still keep in touch, and one of them uh, won a, an, an award, you know, a national award for, for in, in innovations in technology and so on that he had done in, in software or something like that. So, you know, it, it's, it's, uh, these, these tests are scary and frightening. And, but here's the thing, we come to a part in in the Bible this time, um, and it uses the word test. And it tells us that Abraham, the father of faith, the one that, that the Bible, this, this chapter talks about most, because the man of faith, he says, Abraham was tested. So as we read in scripture, open your Bibles, please, to Hebrews chapter 11, verse 17 through 19. <clears throat> so we're, gonna, we're going to look at this story. Uh, it's the story of the ram in the thicket. You remember that? The story of Isaac, uh, Abraham offering up Isaac, his son, as a sacrifice. When, you know, when we say sacrifice, meaning his life as death. God, you can kill him. This is it. And God asked, and why? Because God asked for it, for him, for Isaac's life. Sacrifice, kill your son in honor of me, to please me. So it's a scary test. Don't you see it? Can, can you see it? It's, it's, it's really, it's kind of a weird test, isn't it? So we're going to uh, uh, try to understand this test. And so in Hebrews 11 verse 17 says, By faith, a Abraham, when he was, what's the word? Tested. Tested, offer up Isaac, which was, as we know, is his son. And he who had received the promises offered up his only begotten song. Verse 18, of whom it was said, <clears throat> in Isaac, your seed shall be blessed. Concluding that God was able to raise him up, even from the dead, from which he also received him in a figurative sense. So, in today's message, we're going to look at why tests um, what, that, that, first of all, that there are tests. They're part of the Christian life, okay? They're part of life in general, and uh, people call them trials, struggles, or pain, suffering, or just, just difficult, difficult things, uh, uh, dif difficulties in life. And uh, if you haven't experienced much difficulty, um, there is, you, you haven't lived long enough perhaps, right? Uh, and and I, I, I doubt you, you haven't seen that. Like, it, life is difficult. And, and as soon as, when you were a little kid, you, some of us have had the misfortune of being, or some of you, of uh, being born in a tumultuous uh, environment. And pretty soon you understand what pain is and suffering, uh, either inflicted to you or to the ones around you. And so these things, so this, this, today we will learn that this is real, and it happens. And God, God allows this to happen. And so we will understand how is it that they work, why God puts them there and allows them to happen to us. Why we need these tests. And the, the last one is how to pass them, how to pass these tests, how to do well. So first of all, there, is, there, is, there are tests. Now, if uh, we, we have a, 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 a teacher here that I know, and there's a, few, a couple of people that teach and, 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 and are into education and all these things. So you know that there are two, um, you know, tests are there not because the teacher is mean or is a horrible person. Uh, my mom is a teacher, my dad too, and, and teachers are, are, are good people. Teachers are nice people as far as I, I've, I, you know, it's not like they're mean. But, you know, be, but why do they put these difficult things before us? Why do they give us, gives us exams and tests? Hmm? To see if you know the material, right? To see if you know it. See if you know the material. Do you know the concept? And, 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 and then after you pass the test, the first test, you're moving on to... The same material or new one? New, new concepts, new thing. You're building on it, right? So that's, the, that's why these tests are. And so do you see the parallels in the Christian life? You pass some of the tests, so you move to newer things, better things, bigger things that God has prepared for you. 
So now, <clears throat> there are two uh, types of tests. There are some tests that are meant to kick you out of class, <laughs> to fail you. They are meant to weed you out, right? Have you had those type of teachers who, who, are, who say, well, you will never get 100% in this class. The A is for me. You know, you can get A minus, but nobody gets an A in my class. That's just for me. I, I had those teachers who would say that they were so arrogant and full of them. That, oh, my goodness. They, it's for me. Nobody gets a perfect grade because, you know, why? You know, they, 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 they had that, that arrogant look. And so they, they're meant to, kick, to get you out of the class, to weed you out, to show you what is wrong with you and how imperfect you are. And, 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 and there are teachers like that. And I, 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 we, when I, I, most of my classmates uh, from, from my senior year in high school, uh, I, I have a, a, a group chat that I chat with them once in a while. And so I told them, hey guys, you know, I'm preaching on this. I'm preaching about Taka Taka today. I'm, I'm sharing this thing. And they're like, oh, funny. You know, they, they thought it was hilarious. And, and one of the things that they, um, and I'm remer they started adding some comments that I, I thought it was like, whoa, you know, it was, it was, he was, he was worse than we thought too, uh, later on. But see, there are teachers that are like that. Now there are other teachers that are just as tough, just as rigorous. They will give you tough, difficult tests, and you probably have those teachers, right? They're just as tough. They're there not to weed you out, not to get you kicked out of the program, but they're there to evaluate. Very different, right? They're there to evaluate. They're there to improve you, to help you improve. They're there to prepare you for the test so you can meet the test with confidence. When the tests come, how can I prepare you for this test? Let's see what this possible question you can get, and this is what we can give you. Let me tell you, the first one, the first one, the, 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 the bad teachers, the first one is like the devil. The devil tests you that way. And the devil means for you to fail and wants you to show you what's wrong. And he says, there's no hope for you. You're not good. You're not good for this program called life. You're out. Here, I'll give you some addictions to cope with them. And I'll give you some things to go along. And you're so bad and you're so terrible. You're not good. And then pretty soon, what's, what happens to you? You're thinking of ways, you know, this is life, this is, this is life, I don't want to continue, and you're thinking suicidal thoughts and so on, and discouragement and depression, and everything kicks in. You know what I mean? That's the devil. That's when you're taking tests for the devil. But when you're taking tests for the glory of God, when life throws you really, really difficult situations, and you say, hey, you think about these things and you say, how can this be for the glory of God? What is beyond this test? What ha will happen beyond this difficult, beyond this addiction, beyond this difficulty that I have? What is after this? There's got to be something great. Because, you know, at first I was solving for X. Now I can solve for Y and Z. It's a little bit better. And now I can get moving to more interesting things. You know, I was in algebra, elementary algebra. I can go to al algebra two, algebra three. And then, you know, like all teachers, like all kids learning math, you're asking, oh my goodness, why does solving X help me for in life? <laughs> Pastor, did you ever use those things in life? Mm -mm. You know, math is an interesting thing. Most, most teachers won't tell you, it's like, no, you've got to learn the material, you know. But there are, there are a few math teachers that are really nice, and they're, they're really honest with you. They say, yeah, no, you're not going to learn. You're, gonna use, you're never going to use this in real life. Have you had those teachers? They say, yeah, you're not going to use this in real life. But this is to train your brain to learn how to think and solve problems. So, you can, so later in life, you will have more complex things that you will learn in engineering, and so your mind is trained how to solve and how to do things, and you're like, whoa, okay, cool. So you're grinding there, you're going and learning how to do this, 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 this test that don't, don't seem to go anywhere. So think of that. When you are in trouble, when life 
gets really, really tough, you don't always see, oh, God, why does this help me? How does this help me? How can, the, how can there be, how can anything good come out of this? Right? Don't we ask those things? We can't see the light at the end of the tunnel because we're looking down. But if we look up a little bit, we see Jesus who's standing up there and says, come on, you can do this. You can overcome this test. You can be an overcomer. So, this look. Listen. Li- listen to what Hebrews chapter twelve. And I have to move, move a little bit faster here. Tests are effective. Hebrews chapter twelve, verse eleven. What tests do is that they make you look at yourself, at your strength, at your characters, at your life in a way that you wouldn't do it yourself on your own. You wouldn't do it. They, they make you analyze your heart and realize, oh my goodness, my heart has been somewhere else. Amen? So, Hebrews 12, 11 says, Now, no chastening seems to be, what's the word there? Pleasant or joyful, right? <clears throat> no chastening seems to be present, but what's the word there? Painful. painful. If you're in pain, say painful. If you're in pain today, I, there are difficult things. You know, being, being tested, being in, in, in an uncertain situation, it's not, it's, not, it's not pleasant. And the Bible recognizes this. It's not, you know, you don't have to come to the Bible looking all perfect, looking all good. The Bible is very real, very human. And it says, when chastening comes, when this trial comes, this struggles, they're not joyful. I know, says the author of Hebrews. I know. They're painful. It doesn't feel good. But nevertheless, afterwards, it yields a, the peaceable fruit of righteousness to those who have been, what's the word there? Trained, trained by it. You are being trained. You're in God's gym. And so that is why God put tests in our lives. Now, how do these work? Uh, Verse 11, uh, chapter 11, verse 18 said, of whom it was said, Isaac. We're talking about Isaac. God says, offer up your child and sacrifice him as a burnt offering. Now, a burnt offering meant that um, it had to be burned entirely, everything. Uh, other types of sacrifices were, th- there were different types of sacrifices. Some sacrifices you had to burn the fat and then you could eat the rest of the meat. Some sacrifices, uh, but, but this one, the burnt offering, it was a symbol of surrender. Okay? It was a symbol of surrender to God surrendering everything, and everything had to be burned to the very, very, very end. The atoning, the Day of Atonement, when you were talking about the sanctuary and, 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 and you know, the, 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 uh, the, the Day of Atonement, the Yom Kippur, the way they call it, the Jews, the Jews would call it, the Yom Kippur was, uh, it had to be burned entirely, completely, all of it, very different from the daily sacrifice, okay? So, entirely. Now, a test is not really a tough test, a, 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 Bible, a, a God test is not really a test, unless it kind of feels like death. Like if you decide to be obedient to God, and if you decide to stay strong for the Lord and, 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 and stay there, it will feel to you, it will feel like death. It will feel like you are losing a really, 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 really important thing in your life. It will not feel good. A test is when obeying God seems foolish or even wrong. The promises of God are great, but in this case, His command seems to contradict His promise. I'm sorry, His... Yes, His command, when He says, do this, seems to contradict His promise. So, for example, when you read Psalm 91, it's a beautiful psalm. It says... A thousand shall fall at your right hand, ten thousand on the other, nothing will touch you. And all of a sudden you're sick and you're struggling. And you say, Lord, didn't you say this? 
what does this mean? And you're wondering, Lord, where are your promises? And God says, I will provide for all your needs. God, why are you asking me? Why are you putting this desire in my heart? Remember this, the story that was read for offering? I, think, I thought it was beautiful about Pastor Joel Barrios and, and, and his, his church, in, uh, Spanish American church in, in Tennessee. I know this pastor. I, I, I've, I, I met his brother, actually, but I know, I, know, I, I know of him. I've heard of him. He's got like incredible amount of followers on Facebook, so he's a very prominent guy. So he, this, this, this guy, this gentleman of the story, decides that he needs to be generous with 90% of his thing. Does it feel like death? Like there's going to be a lot of... They need a financial resurrection in that family. <laughs> Doesn't it feel like, oh my goodness, how am I get through this if I'm giving that much money? It feels horrible. But your feelings seem very strong against this command from God. Your wisdom would seem better than God's wisdom. Now, being faithful, or if you know that telling the truth is going to lead to a great loss of money, for example. Or probably telling the truth will get you kicked out of your job. Or, but he says, on the other hand, I will bless you. I will meet all your needs. You know, usually during these, these, these trials, these tests, these struggles, it doesn't feel natural. It doesn't feel, it doesn't feel good. It's difficult. However, even though it doesn't feel good, you have a choice here to make. You are either going to follow God's commands, God's clear word, or you're going to follow your heart. What do we read in, uh, in those, those nice, sweet messages that we send to each other on Facebook, on those memes and things that say, follow your heart? Have you read so many of those? You know, oh, the heart is never wrong. Those chick, chick flicks, movies, you know, they say the heart is never wrong. Follow the heart. Go where the heart leads you. What does the Bible say about our hearts? Sinful, deceitful, perverse. It's not good. You have a sinful nature, so don't follow your heart. Follow God's will. Follow God's heart where he is. Amen? Amen. That's, where he, that's what the Bible tells you. So it's not going to feel good, but... What did we read in, 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 in chapter 12, verse 11? Yes, it's not joyful. It's, it can be painful. But afterward, it yields the peaceable fruit of righteousness to those who have been trained by it. Amen? So the test will not be real until it feels like going through it, it will lead to a kind of death, that it needs a resurrection. You need a miracle in order to, to get through it. And it's, it's a resurrection of your heart, which in reality is kind of like you're, you've been demoted from the throne of your heart, and God is taking ownership of that throne, and He is in the center. In other words, what, what tests do, you know what, you know what tests, tests do? Is that they put Christ back in the center, and I'll, I'll tell you. I will tell you why. So, why is it that we need these tests? Why do we need them? Why is our why is sometimes our wisdom can seem that is against God's wisdom? You know, Abraham. In the story of Abraham, it seems that Abraham had fallen in love with the blessing. He was going to make that blessing, that promise, happen no matter what. He yielded to his wife's proposal. What did Sarah propose to Abraham? What did, he, what did she tell him? She said, hey, you know how God promised, um, to, for, uh, promised us to have a, a, a son and, and we will have many nations. Well, I can't, I'm, I'm already old. And so there's nothing's happening and we're so old and, you know. So here we go. Let's do this with Hagar and you can have an, an, uh, an heir. And Abraham listened. So Abraham was so focused on the promise that he forgot the command. 
Abraham be blameless and righteous before me. See the difference? And he, because he, he did not obey the command, he forgot, he, he couldn't trust the promise. The promise would have never overcome the, the command. Do you see that? So when, when he says, obey, be righteous and blameless before me, he decides to go his own way. Isaac is born, and again, his heart is so in love with this child, and, it, and it, it, it seems right for God. The only reason we see God here asking him, Abraham, offer up this child to me, is because he wants to test him. He wants to know where his heart is. He wants, to, he wants God knows where the heart is, but Abraham doesn't. He seems always good, and now ah, he's going around, yay, we got a kid, we have a son, good, Sarah. My goodness, we are so old, and we look like this kid's great-grandpa's, you know, but this is good, we're going to the promised land, yay, life is going good, our child is beautiful. But he was, God says, it sounds like, it, seemed, it would seem that God noticed where Abraham's heart was. And so he says, Abraham, I, I need you to put me back in the center. And so something that was, it, it helps put things in perspective. You know, when things are, are difficult, it helps us to put, so let's say, let's say you, are, you are training in sports, for example. The Bible uses athletes and, and training very, very often, the Apostle Paul especially. When you, when you, Let's suppose you're, you're in basketball or you're into soccer. Anybody here in basketball? There's a few of us, yay. Anybody here in soccer? That's not very popular around here. Maybe one or two, all right. So when you, oh, you are in soccer. So when you are, what do you do to get better? You go in front of the court. Let's, let's basketball is more popular and more, more well-known. You go in front of the court, in front of the, ba the basketball hoop, and you throw, and you throw. One more time, one more time, again and again and again and again and again and again and again, until finally you're becoming consistent in that target and you're shooting and you and it feels so good when the ball just goes through the net, you know that that shoo, shoo, and you hear that sound. Shoo, shoo. Oh, it feels so good, and you keep getting better and better and better and better every time. Then you go to the coach, and the coach puts a few tests on you, and he says, you got to run faster from here to here. And it's like, oh, running. Yeah, I already know how to run. Why do I need, what I need to get better is at shooting. No, I need to get better at running and agility and all these things. And start doing all these drills. And so that's when you are tested and, he, and, and, and the coach looks at your time and is like, yeah, you're too slow. You're not going to be able to, to move. And your, 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 your endurance is, is lacking you need to go run for so long. You need to jump like this, jump like that. How is this ever going to help me? And the test shows you, and it, and it says, and it tells you, you need to put more effort into training. If you want to get good, if we're going to win this game, you need to put more effort into training. Where is your heart? Do you really want to do this? Do you really want to beat the opponent? And so you stop watching video games, you stop watching, doing, uh, fooling around and eating, you, you're, you start eating better and you start training more so that you can arrive to your goals and, and have the victory. It's the same thing with Isaac, with this test. God says, you need to place me in the center. And that's why he asks him, a burnt offering, the symbol of no reservation, Nothing. And he says, your son, your only son. Didn't, didn't Abraham have another son? But he says in verse, so let's jump really quick to Genesis. Let's go to the story. Go to Genesis verse 21. And at the very last line of verse 12, Genesis 21, Genesis 21, verse 12, God had spoken, but God said to Abraham, do not let 
it be, Genesis 21, verse 12, do not let it be displeasing in your sight because of the lad, because of your bondwoman. So it's talking about uh, Ishmael and the other son that he had, the, the son of the slave woman. Whatever Sarah has said to you, listen to her voice, for in Isaac, not Ishmael, in who? Isaac, in Isaac, your seed shall be blessed. I w will bless you on the miracle son, on the son of the promise, the son that I gave you, not the one that you came up on your own doing, you and Sarah brought up. In Isaac, your seal, seed shall be. So then we read verse, chapter 22, verse 1. Now it came to pass after these things, God tested Abraham and said to him, Abraham, and he said, here I am. Then he said, take now your son, your only son, Isaac, whom you love, and go to the land of Moriah and offer him, I'm reading the end of verse 3, offer him there in a burnt offering and on the mountains of which I shall tell you. So he goes early, he goes there. And, and you know, why did God do this? And I want you to think about your, your, your own life here for a moment. Let's, let's pause on this story. Why offer up your son, your, my only son? Again, it seems that Abraham had become a slave to his son. And sin, this is what sin does. Sin takes the best things in our lives, the best things, the most beautiful things in our lives, and turns them into temptations, turns them into idols. And so God is moved away. It can be our talents. It can be our position. It can be our family. It can be anything in our lives, the good things in our lives, and he turns them into temptations, into idols that take the placement, take the position of God that belongs to God, the most important, most desirable, the best, our treasure. Should be, he should be their treasure, and it, takes, it puts them there. What is your only church in your heart right now? Some of us say, well, if only I had those Jordans, life would be great. You know, when I played basketball in high school, and I was thinking, oh, if only I could have some Jordans, you know, life would be so cool and best and everything. If only I could have some, some, if only I could have, if only I was married. If only, I, if only I had a certain kind of beauty. If only I was in a different school. If only I had a different job or a career. If only I made a little bit more money, I, life will be just fine. If only this test would disappear. If only, you know, and here's the thing. They're, they're, these, these things that we are so focused on having or, or not having, they become idols. And what they do is they sap our energy. They have us focused on these things and we miss the bigger picture. They drain us. They take away our strength. Because if you don't have it, look what's happening. When you don't have those things, when you don't have these certain things that you're longing for, then you think, well, you know, I don't have them. Therefore, what happens to your heart? It's not at rest, it's anxious, it's sad, it's bitter. And you're walking around life, looking down, not happy, not okay, not satisfied. And so in despair and anger and cynicism against the Lord, you don't believe that he's, well, you know. Have you heard this? You know, Amy and I have heard this. They've, we've been told this. When we, you know, we, we, we don't have kids yet, and we're, we're, we're thinking about it. Uh, we're praying about it, and the Lord will, will provide, you know, for us at, at, at the right time. And when, when, it's, when it's time, you know, you'll, you'll know. Um, and and, 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 uh, and you know, people often tell Amy, well, Amy, sleep as much as you want because now when you're a mother, you can never sleep. You know, you will never sleep. You can no longer take naps because life as a mother is awful. You know, and that's kind of the, they don't say that, but that's kind of the attitude, you know. And, 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 and you're thinking, you know, this, this trial, if only my kids would just go to bed and be okay, you know. If only, if only I had money for a nanny who would take, if only my mother would live closer so she could look after them. If only my mother-in-law my mother and I would have a better relationship, she would take, babysit them, you know. It's like kind of a break, because this motherhood thing is awful, you know. That's the way culture wants you to think, you know, lose the traditional 
things. And think about it, you know, because if only, why not enjoy? Enjoy that, that, that time. Enjoy that beautiful time that God has given you. And say, you know, it's struggle. I no longer take naps. But look at the baby, so cute. You know, look at this thing that God has given me, this bundle of joy. I'm glad. I'm glad you can take away all my sleep. I'm okay. <laughs> you know? So just think about those things. You miss it. I have God. I have husband. I have wife. I'm, I'm, I'm good. I have a house. I have a roof. I have heat. And this, this, this winter is coming. I'm okay, Lord. Thank you so much. You know, if, if things are not centered, you, you, your spirit goes down and, you, and, and then your brain gets trained to think ne negatively and cynically. And then what happens? Depression kicks in, meds, etc. So it's not an easy thing, but, but here it is. That's why you need, you know, look what Jeremiah 17, 7 and 8 says. Blessed is the man who trusts in the Lord and whose hope is in the Lord. For he shall be like a tree planted by the waters, which spreads out his roots by the river and will not fear when the heat comes. But its leaf will be green and will not be anxious in the year of drought, nor will cease from yielding fruit. Hmm? That's the one who trusts in the Lord. See, you didn't hear this because I was reading too fast. Listen again. Blessed is the man or the woman, okay, or the child. Blessed is the man who trusts in the Lord, whose hope is the Lord. See how, how, how limited this thing is, whose hope is the Lord. See, the Lord is being very, very clear in his word today whose hope is the Lord. It's not just, I hope in, his, in what he's going to do for me. I'm hoping that, no, no, my hope is himself. God himself is, is my hope. If I have him, I am good. I'm satisfied. I'm rest. I'm at rest. And so if you're in despair, if you're despondent, anxious, bitter, it is because something else, someone else has become your trust, your only and Jesus is not your only. So I, but I want to say a word about depression. Because I don't want you to think that just because you're sad, you're not, you don't love the Lord. If, if somebody here is, is, is struggling with, with depression as a condition, I want you to think that it, it's, it's being depressed is not a sin. It doesn't mean you don't love Jesus. It doesn't mean you're, you, you, you don't trust Him. Your brain has, been, it's, 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 has become in the habit of of having sad feelings, half thoughts. And so, here's your struggle. Read through the Psalms. David, people believe David was depressed. If you read some of the Psalms, goodness, it's, it, they're, they're, they're laments, they're, they're crying, Lord, you're not there, you're hiding your face. You need to read through the Psalms. You need to read through the Gospels and get back into the joy, get back into trusting, get back into believing. Okay, don't feel like, and don't feel like your sin is, is worse that, that, than, than everybody else's, than the rest of us, you know. It's just, you need to get out, train your brain, get, get, get back on the gym, get back on, the, on, on, on God's gym, and, and teach, let your brain be trained by these small tests. Little by little, you'll be overcoming, and you'll be victorious. Amen? Now, how do we pass this test? That's the last part. Okay, ready? How do we do this? Because this is, this is what we knew. This is what we want to know. Abraham, um, if, you, if you look at verse chapter 11 again, don't, don't, we'll go back to, to Genesis 22, so don't, don't lose it. In Hebrews 11, he says, verse 19, that, you know, in whom it's said, in Isaac shall be the seed, concluding that God was able to raise him up from the dead, from which he also received him in a figurative sense. When you conclude something, how do you, do, how do you conclude something? Do you just go and say, okay, let's just, yeah. So, for example, have you seen our, our, our chairs, uh, the, the tables and everything is folded out out there? Because, you know, when the tables were there and everything, the carpet didn't look that nasty. <laughs> but we took it all out and it looks, every time, you know, a, lot, a few of us decided that it, it is, you know, it's, it's just not good. Now, I sent Doranita, uh, somebody that I knew, that to, to help us uh, to do the cleanup, 
and you know to to clean the carpet professionally. Uh, now Doranita, after trying a few times and doing different things, she concluded that this person was not the best one. She 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 analyzed the situation. She reasoned, and she said, you know, we'll we'll get somebody else to do it. And so that's the way you make decisions. You make smart decisions. You make wise decisions for everything else. Why would it be different for Christianity? Faith. Remember the very first sermon on faith that we said? Faith begins with understanding. See, Christians, you're not stupid. You, you weigh the things. You weigh the, the, the situations. You, you, you weigh your decisions. You think it through. And so in this case, look what Abraham did. He weighed, God gave me this child out of nothing. I was a hundred years old when he gave him to me. My wife was 90 years of age. God has prospered me. I have everything I need. If he gave me a miracle child at a hundred years old, he will, I don't know why he's asking me this, but I'm going to trust him. He reasoned, he concluded. And it is this, this thing of faith, of reasoning and understanding and concluding is not just Abraham thing. If you notice, if you look at, at, at all these guys, um, verse 3, by faith we understand. Uh, chapter 11, verse 3. Then you look again that... Um, uh, you know, he, uh, Sarah, Sarah, verse 11, because she judged him faithful who had promised. He analyzed, he judged God. He, he decided that God was faithful. He made a decision. Look at, at verse 19. Abraham concluded. And verse 26 about Moses, when he's saying that he is steaming, steam the reproach of Christ to be greater than the riches and the treasures of Egypt. This is about two, three sermons from now. So he says, you know, I think the riches of heaven are much better than the riches of Egypt. I'm going to go with heaven. Amen. Made a decision, and he took, even though it's going to be shameful and reproach of Christ and so on. That was So don't think, analyze the situation. But here's something that you need to do. You know how we have these phones that they, they take nice pictures? They have, what happens when you go like this on the screen and the camera is there? That's called zoom, zoom in, right? Well, that's what the devil wants you to do with your situation. He wants to, to see, all right? I'm going to zoom in into my situation. Oh, my goodness, I am lonely. I am horrible. I'm sad. This is the, oh, everything I can see. Oh, no. God has wide lenses. He wants you to zoom out. And see the big picture. Stand back. Look at this thing. Conclude. Reason. Don't be a fool, God says. Look at the big picture. Okay. Isn't that so, not, not so bad now, right? When you look at the big picture, when you look what's ahead, the glory that is to come, when you know that Jesus is coming soon, when you know that pain doesn't last forever, when you know that, after all, it's a house, your basement is wet, uh, Okay, yeah, it sucks, but it'll, 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 it'll get better, all right? Your, your situation, you know, yes, I may be lonely, but I have a church family. I, I, more than anything, the best of us, God is with me, and I have people that care. And, you know, you, you analyze, you zoom out. So this is what I, what, what, when, when we are depressed, when we're sad, when we have, we're going through these things, it's hard for us to zoom out and look at the big picture, and you know when you zoom out, you know you could be, you know when you get a camera, you can zoom in into a certain situation, a certain object. When you zoom in, in the Christian life, what do you find in the center? You find the cross of Christ. Amen. That's what you find. We find the cross of Christ. And if it looks so reasonable to go through the test and be obedient to the Lord. It looks very reasonable. It's unreasonable not to be obedient. It's unreasonable. It's foolishness not to follow God's will, not to go his way. And so Abraham realized that he had failed to trust God because it felt right 
you know? And so this time he decided to obey. And you know, that's what he did. Now there's something that, that it's hard for us to understand. Numbers chapter 3, you don't need to open the Bible because it, it's, it's, it's a big, big chapter. And God said, every firstborn is mine. And when you have a firstborn, you, because they're mine, you need to offer an offering, to give an offering of five shekels, or he prescribed different sacrifice for, for poor people, for the poor, but they're mine. If you give this offering, you can keep them. Otherwise, they must be sacrificed to me. And this, is, this was a weird thing. This was the custom of the day, and God used it to help the people of Israel to understand that the firstborn were his, that the firstborn must be sacrificed. So when God, when God said this, to help them understand something that you and I need to so understand, and this, is, this, is a, this, is, this story helps us to understand substitution. Can you say that, please? So you don't forget. Substitution. The substitution of, of God for you, of Jesus, of the cross for my life. And so that's what, exactly what happens. Abraham goes up the mountain and says, I am going up the mountain. He says, look, look at Genesis 22. He says to his people, he, that all the people that he's with, I stay here and the kid and I, meaning Isaac and I, will go, we'll come back to you. We're going up the mountain. We're hiking. We'll come back to you. He has the assurance, remember that? That God is going to do some kind of miracle. That's why this guy is called the, the father of faith, even though he messed up a lot. But he's called the, the father of faith. And he says, here, God will provide. When Abraham, uh, Isaac says, spoke to Abraham, verse 7, Father, and said, my father. And he said, here I am, my son. Then he said, look at the fire, the wood. Everything is here. Where is the lamb for the burnt offering? Verse 8, and Abraham said, my son, God will provide for himself the lamb for a burnt offering. Here, Abraham remembered Genesis 15, the substitution, the substitution. So God walked for the both of them through the pieces. Remember that message about two messages ago? God walked through the pieces. I'm gonna, so he says, he will take, he will provide. And when he says the word here, provide, you can read as well. God will show us a lamb. Something is going to happen. Abraham, as he is struggling so much to go up this mountain with his son to sacrifice him, he is also eager because there's a miracle coming. He has no idea what, he knows, he's anxious. He knows something great is coming. And so he's eager and that's kind of a, a little bit of a feeling of joy that needs to fill our hearts when we're going through a horrible time in our lives. Something great is coming. Something great is coming. There's something better coming up. And then he says, he goes up the burnt offering together. They came and said, Abraham, do not lay your hand, verse 12, on the lad or do anything to him. Now I know that you fear God since you have not withheld your son, your only son, from me. Then Abraham lifted his eyes and looked, and there behind him was a ram caught in a thicket by the horns. So Abraham went up and took the ram and offered it up for a burnt offering before the Lord. And Abraham called the name of the place the Lord will provide. And he said to this day, in the mount of the Lord it shall be provided. So the question is, how do we pass the tests? This struggles. How do we become victorious and how do we become overcomers above the difficult things? Temptations, struggles, sick, disease, anything, depression. How do we rise above those things? Well, we need to know, we need to have faith that God will provide, that God will show us the Lamb. Not only that, but hey, good news. You know where the lamb is. You and I know. Abraham kind of had an idea, kind of thought, well, God walked from, he's got a covenant. He, he did this. I have no idea what he's going to come up with. He is God of heaven and earth. I don't know. But do you and I know where the lamb is and where he was sacrificed? We, know, we see Abraham and Isaac are a picture, a small picture of, of God. God, you know how Abraham said, 
when, 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 Abraham, when Isaac asks, asks Father Abraham and says, hey, what's going to happen? I don't know. This is weird. There's the lamb. There's the, there's the, everything is in place for the burnt offering except the actual sacrifice. And that's what God asked in Gethsemane. That's what Jesus asked in Gethsemane. He says, Lord, I kind of know where this is going. I know. I don't want to go through this. May this cup pass away from me. But instead, Jesus says, not my will, but your will be done. And that's the same thing that Isaac did, Jesus did. Isaac was spared because he was not the Messiah, but Jesus was. And so they both go up the mountain, just like Jesus, just like Isaac had the wood on his back, Jesus carried the cross on his back. And and it's a picture of God going up the mountain with his son, carrying up the cross. In the mountain, in the mount of the Lord shall be provided. That's a picture of Calvary. That's a picture of the cross of God showing you. I will show you the lamb. This is good. You're, you're going to get through this. You need to focus on Jesus. You need to look at him and the goodness and how good and beautiful and faithful God has been all the way. You can be grateful. You can get through this, God is saying. Where is the lamb? Isaac asked. And he was shown. Jesus asked, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And he heard nothing but silence from heaven, from the Father. And the punishment for our sin was laid upon Jesus. And Jesus died for us. He stayed in that mountain. You know, we can say, just like God said to Abraham, now I know, God, how much you love me. Now I know that you love me because you did not withhold your son, your only son. Can we say that to God? The Father, now I know that you love me. When we look at the Lamb, now I know that you love me because you did not withhold your son, your only son. And that is how, my dear church, you become a man and a woman of faith by looking at the Son, looking at Jesus. You know, there's a, ten, there's a temptation. When the test will come to you, you're going to have a temptation to say, no, I don't want to run these drills. I don't want to do this. I don't want to. And you're going to try to go your own way. Laziness will kick in, and la spiritual laziness will try to get there. And you, don't, you will not want to train. You don't want to do the workout. You don't want to go and do it. But don't ruin the test because it'll, don't ruin it. Don't say, oh, I want to go there first and see that the, 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 what's going to happen. Then I will probably think about obeying. No, don't do it. Be faithful. All you can see right now, perhaps, some of you, I have no idea what your situation is. This, this, I, I'm praying that the Spirit would let you know. We, we, your minds are going through certain, er, certain things in your life, right? Right now. And right now, some of you, all you can see is disaster and sadness and difficult times. But it's because your, your life is focused on those things. Zoom out and don't let these things overwhelm. Don't let your mind overwhelm you. Zoom out, look at the big picture and let, look and realize that God is at the center all along, crying out, saying, I did this for you. Amen.